Do you find it hard to witness to someone who doesn't believe about your faith? I think if we're being honest, when it comes to witnessing, we're afraid. What are we afraid of? Well, before I give you sort of the answers to the the common fears among most Christians about the scenario of having to share their faith with someone who doesn't share it, I want you to think about what the answer to that question is for you. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of when it comes to telling others about Jesus? Maybe you're afraid of sounding foolish. Maybe your fear is that you won't be able to use the right words or explain things properly. Your fear might be like that of Moses, that you're just not good at speaking to other people. Or maybe your fear is that the other person is going to come up with some objection to your faith that you don't have an answer for, that you find it difficult to counter, that maybe you'd never thought of. Maybe your fear is that if you share some of the views of your faith, it will harm the relationship you have with that person. Maybe your fear is being, quote, outed, so to speak, as one of those old-fashioned judgy Christians. But I think that all these fears are connected to one central fear that explains where all of those come from. That fear is that we will in some way be responsible if the person that we are speaking to doesn't end up believing in Jesus, that it will be our fault in some way. So if, as with most things, there's a risk of loss, it can be a lot easier to just not participate in the first place. And you'll think about this as a reason for why you should blame yourself. All those fears you listed before, I didn't know enough, I spoke incorrectly, I got angry, I wasn't, I wasn't knowledgeable enough to deal with whatever objection they gave me. All of those fears are rooted in the assumption that if something doesn't go well and the conversation ends with someone not believing, it's my fault. It's my failure. Well, our text today from Mark actually provides some relief from that core fear. But maybe instead it shows us something that we find, at least for now, even scarier to deal with. Now, I want you to think of the person that you want to witness to the most in your life. Close your eyes, picture that person in your mind. Picture the conversation that maybe you've dreamed about having many times. Imagine all the things you hope you know about your faith and are able to articulate them well. The conversation is going great. You're compassionate and you're loving, you're understanding, you're empathetic. You don't get angry, you don't dismiss their concerns. You don't stumble over how to answer their challenges and the doubts that they have about faith in Jesus. In other words, I'm asking you to imagine that conversation taking place perfectly, in the best possible way, and then imagine the result is the person still rejects what you say, and you see their back as they're walking away. Now, it goes from being something you feel great about to becoming your worst fear. And the worst part is it may be a fear that you'd never even considered before. Blinded by the fears about our own failure, whatever form that takes, we didn't even consider the fact that maybe we could not fail at all and still the result would not be what we wanted. Today's text tells us that even if we're an eloquent, loving, perfect witness to the faith, even if we don't get angry or annoyed at the interruption the other person might be in the plans we have for the day, 
and even if we truly love them for all the right reasons, they might still walk away from the faith. It's a scary reality to confront that our text presents us with today. Now, this may release us, and it does release us from some of the pressures and fears that we put upon ourselves, because if the result can be that we do everything right and the end result isn't what we want, it turns out that the result of that conversation was never in our control in the first place. So it releases us from some of the pressures that we put upon ourselves for failing God, for failing Jesus, for ruining someone's chance at salvation. Now, that doesn't stand to mean that you shouldn't reflect on when a conversation goes poorly, because it is true that because of our sin, we can become a barrier to others, and we can speak with them or treat them in a way that we know to be wrong. And when those things occur, we should repent of them and reach out again and, and seek their forgiveness. That often actually can be part of the conversation, the willingness to acknowledge your insecurities and your failures. But today's text presents us with a conversation where Jesus, the perfect Son of God, fails to convert someone. So it tells us that some part of this interaction is beyond our control. So let's break down this conversation between Jesus and the rich young man. And while we will do this, we'll see that both we'll, we'll be taught both the right way to approach and behave when we speak to those who do not believe, and the results of the conversation are ultimately not in our control. Now, this frees us from the pressures we place on ourselves, but it also humbles us, necessarily humbles us, with the reality that we aren't in control of the outcome. We aren't in control of whether or not someone believes in Jesus. Now, some of you may have heard this story from me before, but a few years ago I was at our Eastern District Pastors Convention, and there was a session, a breakout session, on this exact topic, spiritual conversations. How do we talk to people who don't believe the things that we do? How do we witness to them about Jesus? And before the very first question that the presenter asked our group, and, and keep in mind this is a group full of pastors and lay leaders in their congregations, so they know a thing or two about the Bible. And he said, why do you believe in Jesus, was the question. Seems like something that a Christian should know, a pretty basic question. And yet, his question was met with about probably five to ten seconds of silence in a room full of pastors and people who've been in church for a long time. And finally, one of the pastors had the courage to raise his hand, and he said, well, we believe in Jesus because He died on the cross to save us from our sins. Sounds like a good church answer. So the, pre the presenter's response was, no, that is not why you believe in Jesus. Another silence ensued as all the pastors, probably out of vanity, are scrambling to try and figure out what the right answer to this question ought to be. And maybe a little embarrassed for the sake of our brother who got it wrong. We couldn't figure out the answer. It had to be given to us. And the presenter said that the answer is simple but difficult. We believe in Jesus because He gave us the Holy Spirit to do so. The reason we find that difficult is the same reason we find this conversation difficult because they point to the same truth that faith in our life or in the lives of those that we care about or the stranger that kneels in front of us and asks us what must they do to be saved is a gift from God given through His means of grace, which means my eloquent words, my empathy, and my love are not actually responsible for winning someone over for Jesus. This is why we pretty intentionally in the Lutheran Confession do not use phrases like choosing to follow Jesus, because we believe that's not how it works. 
It's not something someone can be convinced of or argued into, but instead it's only a gift from God. So getting back to our conversation between Jesus and the rich young man. The first thing to notice, very first verse of our gospel reading, is the nature of this interaction with Jesus and the rich young man is that it is an interruption. Our gospel reading starts out, as Jesus was setting out on His journey. Jesus has a plan in His mind for His day, and He's beginning His journey, and then all of a sudden, a man runs up and kneels before Him and asks Him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Dear friends in Christ, I must confess as I was reading that portion, I was reflecting on how willing I would be to be interrupted like this. I pondered how effective a strategy of the enemy this must be (laughs) to convince me to fill my life so full that there's no space for sharing the gospel. There's no space to be interrupted for something like evangelism. I have places to go and people to meet and things to do. But here again, Jesus gives us a better example to follow. He doesn't brush the man aside and continue on with his plan or to dismiss his concern or his question because he has a place to be. Instead, he listens to the question and responds. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Can you imagine that being the question that interrupts your day? (laughs) That might be one of the questions that you were afraid of somebody asking you about talking about Jesus, because then I would have to explain exactly how this gospel thing works. And I've heard it a bunch of times, but now I'm afraid because I've never had to explain it to someone before. But of course, Jesus is giving us the example of the perfect way to do this, so He handles this exactly the way that it should be handled. He's ready for the conversation, and He responds. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Now, notice the first part of this, Jesus makes a statement that isn't a question. He says, no one is good except God alone. So we know from this first interaction that the rich young man is missing something, missing some key thing, which makes sense. That's why he's kneeling before Jesus and asking for his wisdom. And Jesus gives some, but he misses it. And we can tell this in his response, because when he responds to Jesus, he says to him, teacher, so he got the don't call me good part, he drops good teacher and just calls him teacher, but then he says, all these I have kept from my youth. But Jesus has just told him no one's good except God alone, and the reason he gives for why they're not good is he lists a bunch of the laws that human beings can't keep. And what is the response of the rich young man? Teacher, I've kept all these from my youth. Now, I want you to imagine a different scenario I think will help us understand the reaction that Jesus has to the sort of arrogance and ignorance that is displayed in the young man's statement. I want you to imagine that you're teaching a small child, whether it's your child, a nephew or a niece, or just any child in general that you're teaching them some basic thing about the world. And they hear your words, and then their response, they say something that makes sense in a twisted sort of way, but isn't what you said. Jesus' response, and this is perhaps the verse in this whole narrative that every time I read this section in Mark, grows on me each time. So after this statement of sort of naive arrogance and ignorance, this is how Jesus responds. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. 
And so I sort of picture in my mind this image of my father talking to me about something, and I say, oh, yeah, so what this is this. And, and then they have a wry smile on their face, and they're shaking their head, and they're saying, no, that's not what it is at all. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Just as when a father or mother is correcting a small child, the correction is done in love. They love them enough to speak the truth, even if the truth might be difficult to hear, or maybe not what they think it is. And Jesus is doing the same thing here. He's looking at this person, this sinner who's interrupted his day, who's asked for his wisdom and then ignores it, and he loves him. And his love leads him to say, you lack one thing, go. Go. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Now, this is where this passage often gets misinterpreted, because we, are, we tend to look at that and we take that and you apply it generally and say, oh, well, one of the things that Christians ought to do is sell all that they own and give to the poor so that we're not in danger of having treasures here on earth instead of in heaven. But there's a very personal nature to the thing that Jesus says here to the man. Jesus knows the man, knows everything about him, and He says to him, you lack one thing. And it seems like maybe that one thing is being poor, that he's got too much stuff, that that stuff is a distraction for him, and those things may be true, but that's not the one thing that he lacks. The one thing that he lacks is his faith is in the wrong things. You see, his first response tells us that his faith is not in God, but it is is in his own ability to keep the commandments of God. His security about his his relationship with God is the fact that I've kept all these things from my youth, teacher. And of course, Jesus knows that's not the case. Just as anyone would be able to tell looking at any of us if they could discern the thoughts of our hearts. But Jesus looks at him and loves him and and pushes against the thing that he lacks. He challenges his faith that has been placed in the wrong things. And he challenges his faith because his faith is not only placed in his obedience to the law, but it is in the security he finds from his great wealth. So what Jesus is really asking this young man to do is not just to sell his stuff, but to stop putting his faith in such things and instead come follow me. Come put your faith in me, Jesus implores the rich young man. So here we are at the end of a conversation, well, almost the end, and it's Jesus versus a regular sinful human being. Jesus has done everything right, right? Nobody can claim that He would have made a mistake here. And He's loved him despite his sin despite the fact that he has put his faith in something other than God, in himself and in the things that he owns. But Jesus loved him still, and in his love implored him with the truth, a truth meant to really actually do the thing that he started out this conversation asking about, which is inherit eternal life. Jesus wants him to inherit eternal life. And he shares with him how he could do that. But the last verse of our text today, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That's hard to wrestle with. Because if it wasn't Jesus in this interaction, our first thought would be, okay, we got to go back and and look at how that, that interaction went. Where did we go wrong? What didn't I say? What did I say in the wrong way? 
Could he tell that I was frustrated with him, that, I, that he interrupted my day and I was worried and anxious about the thing that I needed to get done? But the trouble with the text is it's Jesus. So he didn't do any of those things. He didn't make any mistakes that he needs to go back and that can at least explain how this person doesn't believe. But he doesn't, at least not after this conversation. Now, we don't know for sure that the rest of this young man's life, he doesn't come to faith in Jesus, but the text gives us an insight into the nature of the conversation we have surrounding faith in Jesus, not only our own, but when we share our faith with others. We aren't in control of the results of either. We're purely at the mercy of God. The one thing he lacked, faith in Jesus, and he chose not to believe. He couldn't believe. He rejected the Holy Spirit that was being offered to him in the very words of Jesus. Another mystery of the Scriptures which we have, are unable to explain, that for some reason our God allows us to reject His aid to reject His Holy Spirit freely offered and given, just as Jesus has done here. Believe in Me. Come follow Me. So what are we to do with this difficulty, this challenge? You may be thinking, thanks, Pastor. I feel better about those other things, but now I feel even worse. Well, sometimes... When the Scriptures tell us the truth we don't want to hear, that's the way we feel. But it's important to understand and undergird this entire scenario with a deeper truth, which is, what is Jesus' intention here? And His intention demonstrates to us what God's intention is for everyone, to inherit eternal life. That's why God sent Jesus in the first place. Because he knew the answer to that question, at least for human beings, was there's nothing you can do. It's beyond your ability. So in his mercy, he sends Jesus. And Jesus does all the things that we couldn't do. He keeps the law perfectly. That's the irony of what he says to the young man here. Why do you call me good? Well, he was technically right, even though he didn't know why. Only God is good. But Jesus is God. He is the good that we could never be. He fulfills the law that we cannot fulfill. And through His death and resurrection, we receive as a gift of grace from Him the forgiveness of our sins and the internal life that this rich young man asks about in the first place. That's what we should focus on as believers. Not the worry and the fear that we might mess up, or even the worry and the fear that we can't control the situation because we know who is in control. And the next time you're tempted to think that you are in control or when you come to the realization you're not, I want you to remember this question and I want you to ask it of yourself. Who better to be in control of this conversation my situation, this person's situation, than Jesus. There is no one better. There is no one more gracious, more loving, more merciful than He. I'd say conversations like these and all the other things outside of our control, they're in pretty good hands. In the name of Jesus, amen.